Groups, Tribes, and Human Ultrasociality Okay, there was a famous book in the 1970s called The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. It spawned quite a bit of controversy because it semantically implied that we evolved to be selfish. When what Dawkins really meant was that genes themselves are selfish in that they replicate what was best for their replication. It's tempting to look at evolution via natural selection and conclude that we are all just Machiavellian actors pursuing personal self-interest. This is simplistic and also wrong. Our current genetic makeup passed through many historical bottlenecks. Being the most biologically fit individual in a group meant that an individual had, in retrospect, relatively greater survival and mating success. Consider a human who is completely selfish, maximizing only their own fitness. The rewards would be pretty great for that individual, but then consider what would happen if there were a whole tribe made up of these selfish humans. If this tribe were to come in contact with another group of more altruistic and cooperative and coordinated humans, they would be outcompeted in any sort of warfare or resource exploitation and their gene pool would die out. Sometimes entire groups would perish, while other groups would survive. Those tribal units which were cohesive, cooperative, and which worked together versus a common enemy, tribe, or predators, or during disasters or other challenges, had a long-term competitive advantage. So, natural selection pulled in two directions. On the one hand, towards selfishness, and on the other hand, towards group solidarity and cooperation. We are, by necessity, descended from altruistic groups and from selfish individuals. This is a fundamental truism about human nature. Biologically, it makes no sense to risk your life to save someone genetically unrelated. But there are lots of stories about a soldier throwing himself on a grenade to save his company mates. He wasn't doing the fitness calculation. His brain just evolved in a situation where most of the people around him were direct or distant relatives. Us versus them in tribal times was a big deal and remains so today. The result is we have two competing natures that drive us, cooperation and competition. We can visualize this dynamic on a sports team. A football team needs to work in concert as a single unit in order to beat the other team. But within the team, only one or two athletes might be eligible to win MVP or get drafted by the professional NFL. So there's a constant interplay between what's good for me and what's good for us, my team. The inherent conflict between those two evolved drives explains a great deal of human behavior and history. It also explains why we are so intensely groupish. In-group bias is giving preferential treatment to members of a group to which one belongs. My out-of-state students at the University of Minnesota are taken by surprise that when U of M plays their home state like Iowa or Nebraska for a football game, they feel like supporting their home state's team. Since it's their home state, they find it shocking to hear their U of M friends ridiculing the competing state's culture, teams, and stereotypes. But the same students would not take offense if it was some other third state like Illinois and would probably join in. Everyone knows intellectually that this reaction is superficial in the scheme of things, but these intense feelings are very real, a limbic system carryover we all share from our tribal past. What's going on here and why does it matter? Because we have these groupish tendencies, it's part of human nature to quickly and arbitrarily create groups and ardently bond with and defend them. This is referred to as in-group, out-group bias. In addition to the physical benefits conferred by being part of a larger entity, group delineations affect our psychology as well. Within our own groups, we tend to attribute our successes to our own smarts and personalities, and our failures to misfortune or the bad actions of outgroups. This is termed in psychology fundamental attribution error. 
yet we attribute any success by those in outgroups not to skill or talent, but to unsavory actions like cheating and their failures to flaws or lack of intelligence. We also tend to characterize outsiders using simple, broad swath stereotypes while we treat in-group members as unique and valued individuals. This prevalent and intense favoritism for our own in-groups, whether they are political, ideological, or from astronomy club or fans of a favorite sports team, is one of the strongest remnants of our evolutionary past. It doesn't take too much imagination to see how this manifests today. Have you been on Facebook lately? One of the biggest manifestations of in-group, out-group bias in our past and in our present is the phenomenon of racism. First of all, some context. Modern humans are 99.9% genetically related to each other. This is 12 times closer related than two chimpanzees from the same forest in Tanzania. We all left Africa very recently as a percentage of time we've been a species. But as the previous few slides indicated, we inherited from our great grandsisters a tendency to make knee-jerk categorizations on who's in our tribe and who isn't, because historically that usually meant who was with us or against us. We subconsciously and instantaneously put people into mental categories. Skin color, dress, behavior are all immediately noticeable things and the brain can't help putting people into groups. But as soon as we have some context and more information, that dynamic can change. For example, if I meet a Middle Eastern man at a Minneapolis restaurant wearing a white garb and a turban, and then we strike up a conversation and it turns out he loves the Green Bay Packers and studies renewable energy systems, the different color ethnicity grouping in my mind immediately morphs into more familiar in-group associations. I encourage you to try examples like this. Notice your own reactions as it happens. This is not an easy topic today because racism is a very real thing. But it's helpful to recognize this behavior derives from our evolutionary instinct to put people in in-group and out-groups more than it is about the amount of melanin in our skin due to a few different alleles. Shown above is the skin color of native populations around the world Native peoples further away from the equator generally have less melanin and more of the enzyme tyrosinase, but all of us came from the same place not that long ago. This dynamic is vital to understand because as society undergoes stress, think 9-11, the 2008 recession, pre-World War II Germany as historical examples, we tend to be more protective of our in-group and more fearful and antagonistic of out-groups. So racial and other social tensions get worse. This can be at least partially overcome if it's understood. Okay, on a non-trivial tangent, the same brain mechanisms that enable us to become more tolerant of people that don't look and act like us allow us to extend the boundaries of our groups to include non-humans. I have no children, so other than my students and my one brother, my core in-group is shown on the right. My brain pretty much treats my dogs as if we all live together as a family. Because we do. But in addition to the dogs in my house, I also share affinity with and care for the 5,500 remaining mammal species on the planet. As we're going to discuss in Nexus 10 on systems blindness, we don't think about this much. But some outgroups have very little voice in our societal discussions about the future. Shown here is a picture of my colleague DJ, who in addition to befriending and doing yoga with dolphins, also scientifically demonstrated that dolphins have self-awareness. They're not people in the traditional sense, but they are another group of large complex life forms with self-awareness. So we've seen how intensely social we are, which means we're cooperative and competitive and we care about our groups and we ostracize outgroups. Explains a lot. But if we expand this beyond our own sphere into our nation, our culture, the global economy, let's take a look at what that implies in the second part of this video.